tonight, the life and times of Neil Kinnock as he turns 80. Welcome to Sharp End. For nearly a decade, Neil Kinnock led Labour must take cover. and hoped to lead the country. But Britain was changing. Clashes in the conference. I'm telling you, you can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. Clashes in the country. Clashes in the Commons. The right honourable gentleman doesn't even know what it means on his house. His story is more than the man who almost made it to number 10. So as he marks his birthday, he, and those who know him best, reflect on Kinnock at 80. Neil Kinnock, how do you want to be remembered? As a flank forward, about 6'2", lots of hair, uh, fiery but calm, uh, elegant with the ball, ferocious tackler and a great kicker. Neil is an extraordinary character. I mean, larger than life, immense charm, great charisma, you know, wonderful to be around and with. Charismatic, hugely charming. Um, if he comes into a room, you know immediately because the noise starts. <laughs> Frequently the singing, not always. And he's a fantastic father, um, a wonderful grandfather. So great with, with my uh, two kids, always has been. And he's been a devoted uh, husband to my mother. So I'd say he pretty much ticks all the boxes. <laughs> So much did Trudiga, the Valleys, shape you and your politics? A great deal, really, partly because of this realisation that every advantage we had, every good thing that happened, from the snooker in the workman's hall to the operatic concerts to Trudiga Rugby Football Club and Trudiga Methodist Cricket Club that I played for, uh, was the result of collective action. And that was the Valleys in the 1950s. What were your parents like? My mum and dad were wonderful people. They were like millions of others whose opportunities to manifest their full talents and high intelligence had been stunted by the system. My mother thought the best of everybody and God help you if you let her down. My father thought the worst of everybody and would be your best friend if you proved him wrong. If we could wave the magic wand and they'd be here now, what would they made of that? Uh, my father would be quite proud but he would have said, um, as he did on the night I phoned them when I got selected for Bidwesty, the second safest seat in the country at 28 years of age. When I said to him, Westminster next stop, Dad? And he said, oh, I don't know. People can be funny. Thanks very much, Bob. Thanks a lot. But in 1970, the people of Bedwechty, later renamed Isloin, sent the young man to London after all. See Westminster here now. Does it sort of still stir up emotions? Not really. I, I'm one of those people who always treated it as a place of work. And I, I think really it might have been that I was uh, influenced from the start by the way that Anarin Bevan described it. He said with its hush corridors and attendants and stained glass windows and great vaulted halls, it seems like a church dedicated to the most reactionary of all religions, ancestor worship. And I, 
I read that when I was a kid. And I, I think it probably influenced my attitude. They come around to this business of oratory. When they're being nasty, they call it rhetoric. But when they're being nice, they call it oratory. With his flair for language, he would often be compared to Nye Bevan. And at times, he would use his tongue to lash out at his own Labour government. He did it in 1979, as Wales pondered whether it wanted its own assembly. Good evening and welcome to Referendum Special, one of the last opportunities you will have before polling next Thursday to put your questions on the devolution issue direct to the politicians. And anything that militates against that prosperity, like the extra costs of the Assembly, like the risks that we take because of the block grant, is militating against that. But I thought then, I think now, that the form, I emphasise that, the form of devolution that we've got continues to inflict disadvantages uh, simply because devolution is not a reality throughout the whole of the kingdom. After a second electoral defeat in 1983, Labour chose Neil Kinnock as its new leader. But he got off on the wrong foot. Now that sort of thing is just not supposed to happen. And even as Mr Kinnock put the best face on things, he was wondering whether, wet feet and all, the cameraman might choose to use those shots that were a little more dignified. <laughs> He's got no chance. Watch tomorrow's papers. I think you might be interested to know the full story behind this. Anybody observing the film can see that Glennis is wearing very smart, light grey suede boots. She bought them the day before in Brighton. She was very proud of her boots. And consequently, when we went for a walk, stupidly, my idea, on the beach, and the tide came in, even my wife, who was a seafarer, tried to leap away in order to save these boots. And in leaping away, she <clears throat> destabilized me so it's the damn boots that did it. Glennis's light grey suede boots. In the 1980s, everything seemed to be changing. New ways replacing old ways. But some industries stood strong. Coal mining still employed tens of thousands of people. But when the government announced more pit closures in 1984, the mining union, the NUM, and its leader, Arthur Scargill, called a strike. It became one of the most bitter, divisive, and controversial periods the country had ever witnessed. The Labour leader, whose father had been a miner, did not publicly back the strike. He argued the NUM should hold a national ballot of all its members. We're entitled to ask for that support after seven months not fighting for the National Union of Mine Workers, not fighting for the jobs of miners, but fighting against the whole concept of this government's economic policy. Almost four decades on, the scars of that period are fresh. People endured not only that year, but years of deep poverty as a consequence, and social division, family breakup, all kinds of malignant effects. If Arthur Scargill were here now, sitting in this room, he'd say, by not supporting the strike, you betrayed the miners. Mm. I know Scargill would say that, but that would be part of his fantasy. The idea that a party in opposition, by declaring political support 
for a strike that had taken place without a democratic pa ballot, according to the requirements of the rules of the NUM, would have had no effect on the strike itself whatsoever, but it would have completely destroyed its own credibility, not just across the mining communities, but across the communities whose votes we needed in order to get the power to give assistance to the mining communities and many others across the whole United Kingdom. The miners' last stand ended in defeat. After the strike, the coal industry in Wales and beyond slowly faded away. Some never forgave Neil Kinnock for his stance, but his attention turned to a new battle, one with his own party. By the mid-1980s, with two electoral defeats in a row, Labour was in a civil war, the party facing oblivion. So Neil Kinnock, who had been on the left, decided to take on that wing of the party. You've got to understand that in 1983, when Neil took over, the Labour Party was an incredibly low ebb, and the far left were very strong, and, you know, he had them... To, to seize the Labour Party, and then through a period of Thatcherism, when the Tories were doing things which naturally meant you wanted to stick with, for example, mining communities against the Tory government, you know, when people, unemployment was very high and people, particularly in places like Wales, were really suffering. He had to, to say to the Labour Party things they really didn't want to hear. The speech had been delayed by a year because of the miners' strike. But in the conference of 1985, he launched his attack. And he focused on the left-wing group known as Militant. I'll tell you what happens with impossible promises. You start with far-fetched resolutions. They're then pickled into a rigid dogma, a code. And you go through the years sticking to that outdated, misplaced, irrelevant to the real needs, and you end in the grotesque chaos of a Labour Council, a Labour Council hiring taxis to scuttle around the city, handing out redundancy notices to its own workers. I'm telling you, you can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. So I knew what I was going to say, I knew how I was going to say it, even though, as usual, I wrote this speech overnight the night before, which is a bad habit that I had, and it had the intended effect. I made it because it was absolutely essential for the integrity of the party, the identity of the party, and certainly the future of the party. Neil Kinnock saved the Labour Party um, for a variety of reasons. One, not least, the way in which he made the party face up to the challenges of modern politics. And he very much brought the party together to, to such an extent that even when we didn't win in 1992, and, and then John Smith became the leader and I became his deputy, and we really thought, I think John and I, that, you know, well, this will all fall apart. People will start taking chunks out of each other. They didn't. They didn't. It held. Last Welshman to be prime minister. Indeed, yes. The, the original Welsh windbag, of course. That was one of the names that they gave him. And uh, I didn't mind that so much. If they called me the old goat, as they called him that, I would have minded a bit. Neil Kinnock had two attempts at becoming the first Welshman since Lloyd George to live in number 10. The first was in the election of 1987, when he faced a formidable opponent. I've got the power. 
opposing Mrs. Thatcher was easy because I disagreed with just about everything that she did and was. The right honourable gentleman doesn't even know what it means or his consequences <laughs> When Mrs. Thatcher resigned, Edward Heath, former Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister, apparently said, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. What did you say? Oh, I said to our people, our greatest electoral asset has gone through the door. My eyes are fully open to my awful situation. I'm increasingly unable to conceive my desperation. If you ask what I believe in, I have simply no idea, which is why I'm rather given to this verbal diarrhea. Being lampooned is an occupational hazard for a senior politician. Featuring weekly on Spitting Image probably helped Neil Kinnock's profile. But the attacks became more personal in the run-up to the 1992 general election. Do you internalise that and think, no, that's wrong, that's not what my father's like, he's, he's not like that? Yeah, it gives you a thick skin. And so, you know, even probably by the age of 16, I had skin like a rhino. God knows how <laughs> thick my skin is by now. <laughs> By the time of the election, the prospects were good. He faced a new opponent, John Major. He had a new, younger team around him. And he had good opinion poll numbers. It felt like Neil Kinnock would be the next Prime Minister. Had his moment finally arrived? From the headquarters of Independent Television News, Election 92. It's neck and neck in the race for Downing Street ITN projects the two main parties very close, with John Major perhaps a fraction ahead of Neil Kinnock, the most likely outcome a hung parliament. The polls got it spectacularly wrong. The Conservatives won a fourth term in a row. We will sustain these values. We believe them to be the real values of the British people. The Saturday after the election, I was phoned by a friend who was a very se senior and well-respected poster, Bob Worcester. And Bob said, Neil, I'm calling you to tell you how much you lost the election by. I said, Bob, it's tattooed on my eyelids, mate. And he said, no, uh, but you won't have done this figure. You lost the election by 1,420 votes. That was the combined majority of the bottom 11 conservative seats. So we came very close, but of course, very close is never enough. He was unlucky in 1987, he was deeply unlucky in 1992, but the truth of the matter is the public were at that stage ready to elect the Labour Party. John Humphreys, you know, the broadcaster, repeatedly told me of his theory that uh, I lost the 92 election because I was Welsh. I said to him, John, I can't afford to believe that. An impression was given of me, I know, which cumulatively could have made the difference in some minds. But the people who say, if you hadn't been Welsh, you'd have been elected, I think they're wrong. The people who say, political commentators say, Neil Kinnock, he never got over 92 and had defeat. Oh, that's wrong. Uh, I was over it by the Christmas. As uh, a period of mourning, if you like, of disappointment. Uh, and there was life to be had I, with this wonderful wife and a great stretch of possibilities in front of me. So you have to get on with it, don't you? Neil and Glenys have been together for almost 60 years. She was a national figure in her own right, an MEP, and unlike her husband, a government minister. But family always came first, with their two children and then grandchildren. You and Glenys have been a double act throughout. Could you have done everything that you have done without Glenys by your side? Oh, I don't think that life would have been anything like it has been without Glenys. Uh, we met when I was 20, she was 18, just 18, poor girl, in the first week that she was in university. Her first words to me, as I was canvassing a lunch queue in the students' union, are you the man from Socialist Society? And I was so chuffed at being thought of as the man from Socialist Society. And of course, she was a very attractive 
Young woman, she was lovely with brown hair, beautiful. She's got Alzheimer's, which is dreadful because she still had so much more to give. And now she can't give it. And she finds that frustrating sometimes. Uh, I find it, my reaction is different. I find it infuriating uh, and not in any way pitiful because she's done such a lot. It's been a trauma for our family, there's no doubt about that. And I think the, one of the worst aspects of it is that she just isn't the same person anymore that she was. And it takes a lot for us to remember how she was. So, you know, we've still got photographs and um, we still remember her as being just this incredibly vivacious, bright, on the button person constantly being cheeky to him and giving him all sorts of hassle throughout their entire uh, <laughs> married life as far as I could see it was sort of they, they only ever had one row but it lasted for about 40 years you know, that's, uh, um, and and now all of that is gone uh, so it's painful it's, it's just painful and it's a it's an awful awful illness and um, we've had to find ways of coping with it. But we're a very strong family, so we'll, we'll get through it. And, uh, and we'll, we'll always, always love her, whichever stage she's at in this awful illness, and we'll get through it. She brought up the kids, really, and made a hell of a job of it, great job. Right through the years, when I became a member of parliament, when I was leader of the party, she was there as an absolute stalwart. He may be out of the front line, but even at 80, he remains a political titan. Leadership means making decisions. Some will support your choices, others will not. But nobody can doubt that Neil Kinnock made an impact. How do you think you will be remembered? guy who tried 